come on in. So I'm Billy Thompson, I'm the founder and project director of the Retreat Animal Rescue. We've got the most beautiful eyes, They're like such knowing eyes. Animals do talk, but only to those who listen. Dad, have a little cuddle? Yeah? Those animals tell their own stories. This is Duchess, who's not a great fan of humans because she spent the longest out of our cows here on a farm. So she was like eight years into life on a farm and we rescued her. If you come in and you take the time to stop and stare and stand with them, they're all going to tell you this incredible story. This is Drury. He like our puppy. He was literally just slaughter age. So he was 22 months old when he arrived. So important that the centre's open because you get those people to come in and meet those animals. People go away thinking, actually, I could be someone different, which will impact on their lives. So we have all sorts of animals and each and every one of them is just remarkable. Each and every one is just this miracle of life and they all differ massively. They're all in their little bedroom at the moment. So come and, come and see some piggies. Right, everyone. We come to say hello. Once you know animals, you know how super intelligent pigs are. Just observing them, you can learn so much. Pigs have this intricate language. They actually sing lullabies to their children. Not even primates or dolphins do that. This is like something that just human mammals do and pigs do. You might be a bit of a legend. They are great negotiators, great problem solvers. They will be the grumpy one. Don't worry, Growler, she's not coming near you. And they'll be the happy one. You're only saying there's room for everyone. They'll be the laid back one. <laughs> Look, Russ wants his... All right, Russ. Families of pigs always stick together. They always return to the nest. If mum's got 10 babies, there'll be enough space around her for those 10 babies. They don't lose that. You know when you do the shut up of a night and you go around and you count the heads to make sure everyone's all right. You know you're going to get Arnold's family there. You know you're going to get Neville's family there. You're going to get Toffee's family there. You won't find one that's moved off. It just doesn't happen. But I'm speaking of 30 years of experience of keeping domestic pigs. So, you know, they are so family orientated. So it's a, it's a crime that, especially in the meat industry, that sows can't nurture their children because she's in a crate. She's, you know, she can't communicate, she can't move them. Um, she can't collect bedding. And, uh, I mean, all of this is just criminal, isn't it? Do not cause any trouble with your sister or there'll be trouble. Actually, your mum's over there, I'll tell her. We take ex-industry pigs and then we take pet pigs. You never get an ex-industry pig that is like comes in and wags her towel and says hi. You know, they're all, always terrified of humans. They're um, generally overweight, always terribly towel docked, that's something. I mean, some have their teeth removed. We're not talking about like veterinary um, exercises here where you take your cat to the vet and it gets a dental. This is like just some person at the farm whipping out the teeth. Well, later on, you know, as pigs get older, you get lots and lots of tooth problems. Pigs should have a towel. There's good reasons why they should have their towels. So towel docking is really appalling. You get pigs that have had their ears punctured so that they have these tags in them, which they're ripped and torn. And of course, if, if anything like that happens at the center here, we'd get a vet right away and uh, it'd be stitched and cleaned properly. We had an ex-industry female arrive. She could not see and so we just assumed she was blind. And then when the vet arrived, the vet was just like, no, this is just like lack and lack of care. She must have had an eye infection and um, it was never treated. It doesn't fall into the profit margins, does it? If you keep calling it in the vets and stuff. So yeah, definitely ex-industry pigs will always arrive. Um, with ailments and illnesses and stuff. And uh, when they're so heavy, it causes all sorts of things because they're little tiny legs, haven't they? They might have this great big body, but they've got these little tiny legs. So you get all sorts of leg problems and foot problems. We keep our ex-industry pigs nice and lean. So they're kind of, you know, they're very agile and stuff. So yeah, and give them what they need. There's my namesake, that big Bill. You actually came with a big family, Bill. In the industry, females do lose one litter after another. And actually, does, does that probably make it worse? Because there's this term cancellation of hope, which is where the, the animal actually knows that they're going to lose their children. So they have the, like the initial collapse emotional state. They kind of give birth. 
they clean and they feed, but they don't have this attachment. You know, puppy farm dogs, it happens to, race horses, it happens to, and obviously farm animals. So you imagine time after time, your body's telling you, you've got your babies now, you're gonna feed them, you're gonna look out for them, keep them safe and clean them. And, and it doesn't happen because one day someone turns up and takes them all away. And then the system is just there for it to happen again and again and again for her until, you know, maybe that she doesn't or she goes the same way that they've all gone. Trying to give these piggies back a, an artificial family and, and eventually it does work because they have some companionship. But I don't think it, they, we ever turn them around because we can't imagine it, can we? It's just so dark, you know, what's happened to them. The kind of the massive loss of, you imagine like a sow who has 10 children each time and every period of time, 10 babies gone, 10 babies gone. How they don't just lay down and die, I'll, I'll, never, I'll never know. So yeah, it's, it's, it's terrible. No different to your dog, you know. She's just like, she could be lying in someone's lounge, couldn't she? On a rug, in front of the fire, they're all watching EastEnders. So when our little tiny babies arrive here, they're terrified and they're frightened. And of course, all they want, like all babies, they just want their mum. We have to do our best as a standing mum. At first, they don't sleep properly, they don't eat properly, they don't rest properly. They don't do any of the things that they would do if they had their mum. You've got this terrible situation where we've got to do our best as, as a mummy. And once we start giving them love and caring for them, and they start to accept that you're not gonna hurt them, that's when they start to thrive. And, and uh, you'll see those little moments, slowly but surely, they start to return. So you start to see those little joyous moments where they start to play. I've had them fall asleep in my arms. You know when they're getting that kind of sleep that they feel absolutely, this is all right. She's died and gone to heaven. She's like, get on with it, dad. So at the center, all animals have names. We took in a family of 60 children. All look the same, they're all saddlebags. And we got Dad, so Dad was Neville. They were called Neville's family until slowly but surely little personalities arrived or veterinary care was done. So they would get their names um, eventually. And a remarkable thing about names is that, so for instance, he, Daddy was called Neville. You would tell Neville's story, you know, which is a survivor's story, we have to remember that and people can relate to it. And what happens is, so they remember Neville, they remember Neville's, Neville's story and Neville's family, and they go home and they tell people about Neville's struggles and none of the young had their mums, but they had this great dad who was a great peacekeeper. You tell people, this is a family, this is Neville's family. And people relate, you know, they, people know they've got families, so they, they, they start to understand. So it's really, really important that we, 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 we tell those stories and, and make people understand that everyone is an individual, everyone's got a name, everyone's got a story. And in this case, when it comes to farmed animals, you know, they've got not just a story, they've got a survivor's story because for everyone who's here, we can't imagine the number that's not here. In here, there's, a, there's about 100, because that's their yard. So they, they go out there and come in and they can use the barn. Killing methods like gas chambers for pigs it really is unimaginable to think what they go through and in such vast numbers. Why is there no outcry? If someone was gassing guinea pigs or puppies, we'd be beside ourselves. But what, it's because someone wants to eat a bacon sandwich. Is this really, you know, or is this just because someone's making a hell of a lot of money? So you're in, keep carrying on indoctrinating those people that eat the bacon because someone's making a lot of money. When people are in denial, and they are in denial because they think farm animals, they're so different to other animals. But look, culturally, other people think this about dogs and we're mortified, you know, that people might eat a dog. What, people would eat a golden retriever? But listen, there are people who think, how can you eat pigs? Look at how wonderful they are. I can call their names uh, and they come. There are pigs who sit for digestive biscuits. There are actually pigs who prefer things to others, just like your dog would. It's so easy just to think, oh yeah, this, this sandwich of a piggy tastes nice, but listen, there are all sorts of alternatives that, look, that taste nice. As a nation of animal lovers, how, how does that sit? Nation of animal lovers, as we talk about the UK a bit, and humane slaughter. 
It's an oxymoron, isn't it? It's, there's no such thing. There's a queuing system, especially being British, you have to queue politely. Those pigs in the industry that are being gassed are absolutely no different to my pigs that, you know, people would say, oh, but they're your pet pigs. No, they're absolutely not. They all started off the same place. They were all born to mothers who were taken away. They're, they're all babies anyway. The ones who go to the gas chambers are all, are all babies. All they want is their mum. So just imagine if one day, for whatever reason, we couldn't keep our pig is, and would people think that's wrong? You know, if our pig is had to go to the gas chamber, would people be thinking, oh, that's terrible because they were pet pigs? I wonder if they would, or if they just think, no, that's all right for pigs. They're super intelligent, they're super sensitive, they know fear, they understand, they can smell, they can sense things. There's all sorts of things that they're far more aware of than we, than we are. You know, we, we could get in a lift with 10 psychopaths and not know, pig wouldn't get in the lift. Their senses are far more heightened and to think about how fearful those poor creatures would be to have a, you know, a death like the gas chambers. I mean, just unbelievable. Stu doesn't bear thinking about really. Look at that beautiful face. Look at their faces though. We bury the dead and we look after the living. If I sit back and I think of all the ones who have died, I'm no use to anyone. So what's facing in front of me, the ones I can help, I'm gonna help. I'm not gonna dwell on what I can't do anything about. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something about what I can do. So I'm gonna look at the glass as half full and I'm gonna make sure that I support the people who can make kind choices and do things and make a difference to animals' lives. Do what you can with what's put in front of you just by not taking that pint of dairy milk, but taking that carton of plant milk, you are gonna make a massive difference. And hey, look, no effort, because it's the same effort, dairy milk, plant milk, no more effort. You make those kind choices, you start with what's on your plate and start talking to people. That's outreach, everyone you talk to. Everyone, everyone has their own audience. You don't have to worry about not knowing the facts and the figures, you've all got your own audience. And I would challenge anyone, you know, to come and meet the pigs in, in sanctuaries. Anyway, go to any sanctuary and see those pigs. Then tell me that should those little lives be cut short just to give you a, a sandwich. You're gonna be hard pushed to find people once they meet pigs in sanctuaries say, this is still all right, you know, this is still all right. Of course we know it's not all right. How can it be all right? I'm seeing people's way of thinking change. I mean, we're on a crest of a wave. We really are. We're just riding this wave and it's just amazing. There is this beautiful world that awaits us. And as our eyes open, you know, ignorance is not bliss. That's what we should really, really emphasize here. This is bliss. Once you know, once you connect with animals, we stop looking at animals for what they can give us because animals are here with us and they're not here for us. And that's the beautiful thing about animals. They want nothing from us but we always want something from them. So this beautiful vision of us just seeing all animals equally, kindness and compassion, they're not segments, they're not like an orange. You can't pick your segment of kindness and compassion. You gotta have the whole orange. You, you gotta be completely kind to everything. We've got some catching up to do humans, but we are going in the right direction. So be kind, it's easy. <laughs>